Hi everyone, Wapio here, and uh, I'm offering to have this little moment with everyone because people have been asking me what to do <laughs> about the virus, all right? I'm getting it from a different quarters that all of a sudden home birth looks really good. It's kind of blowing up uh, in the sense that people are making a decision that they would feel more comfortable or safer having their babies outside the realm of a hospital. And there is also the concern, will the hospital actually have a bed for me? Will, will, will there be uh, enough people? Will there be enough resources to take care of birthing women? Of course, we know that for decades, women have birthed at home in a very self-directed way with people who are truly invested in them. So I want to go through and give you some advantages of a self-directed birth. And by what, what I mean by that is, um, are, we even, are we even in a place where there would be enough midwives to attend us at home? Are we in a place where we actually even want anyone else coming into our home, all right, and bringing anything to the place that we live? All right, so my point again, coming back to the idea of a self-directed, all right, uh, birth where perhaps you find out that it's just mom and dad, all right, does that work? Of course it does, that's been going on for eons, all right? So, one of the first things I wanna say is I mentioned that, that families have been giving birth uh, with people who were invested in them. And I think that is a huge topic in birth today, investment. And across the board, if I had any advice to give to a, a pregnant family or a pregnant woman, I would say birth with the people who are most invested in you, that have your back, that don't have any other agenda for you. Now, who is that? Who is most invested in you and this baby? From my experience, it's the father of the baby or your partner, all right? So that person should be key in terms of being your, your person, as it were, in the, in the birthing realm. That person is probably the most important other person that you could be with as your perfect intimate advocate, all right? And then, who else would you want to pull into your experience? Who else is invested in you? If you even want to pull anyone else in, all right? Um, so the first thing that I would say is when you set up your birth, really consider who you want to be there. Is it just you and your partner? Do you want to have a doula on the phone? Do you want to have a doula outside in the car? Do you want your midwife to come? All right, all of these things, all right, are decisions that you're going to have to make in terms of where you actually feel most comfortable, but most safe. And I think it's kind of ironic in a way that women left the, the left the nest of their own home to go to hospitals because they were told it's more it's, it would be more safe. And now what's happening is the exact opposite. Women are thinking about going home to the nest in their home because that would be more safe. So here we go. All right, advantages of a self-directed birthing experience. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm gonna start with your home. What, what is the advantage of being home? Well, for me, first thing is the ambiance there, all right? The ambiance there is one of safety and satisfaction, all right? This is your home. Uh, no one else is going to disturb you. So you're undisturbed at home. And I have found over the years as a midwife that um, when birth is undisturbed, it flows in a much more straightforward manner. Uh, I have spoken to lots of people, and when I talk about my, my statistics, as it were, you know, if you know me, that I have seen very, very few uh, complications over 20 years, 20 some years of practice, all right? And um, I just don't believe, you, you know, I know that complications are not normal, all right? I haven't seen them. 
Uh, I have Rolodexed in my mind for about 500 births how many births I was actually really, really needed for, where there was really some kind of complication that that no one would have been able to handle a, except someone on the outside, a midwife or a doctor. Uh, uh, very few. All right. Okay, so I want to bring that level of reassurance that sometimes when you're in your home not being disturbed, your birth will flow much more easily and, and in a more straightforward way. Now, I'm certainly not saying it's going to be less painful, or, or maybe, I'm not, maybe it will be easier, but it, it, I see it be more straightforward, all right, and I see way fewer complications. All right, so you've got the, the undisturbed piece, and then that creates the ambiance to keep your hormonal levels normal. This is key to me in birth, and especially uh, in the immediate postpartum, when we're going to talk about the birth of the placenta and so on. Keeping your hormonal levels with high oxytocin, all right, now that's the highest level that you have in your uh, birthing cocktail, as Michelle O'Donnell says. Uh, and then adrenaline, prolactin, eh, estrogen, sugared rim on that cocktail. All right. And what happens when you are not disturbed is your oxytocin levels stay high. All right. Meaning smooth muscle tissue is going to stay contracted meaning you won't bleed, all right, rather than having adrenaline levels rise, all right, which can happen when you are disturbed. So this is an incredible advantage of being in a, in a home setting where you're not disturbed by anyone. You're less likely to have problems, really, in the unfolding of your birthing experience. All right, here's another thing, the bacteriologic perspective. Bacteriologists will tell you in a heartbeat that you're much safer at home when it comes to bacteria and infection, all right? Bacteriologists know that you are immune to all of the germs, etc., in your bubble. In my uh, apprenticeship, I worked at a clinic in Juarez, and some of the women that came, we knew that they didn't really live in... Mm, the kind of hygienic situations that we might live in, all right? Dirt floors and, and so on and so forth, all right? Yet they never got infections. Why? Because they were immune to everything in their world, see? So an advantage of being at home is whatever is there, you are, uh, you have built up immunities to anything and, and, and you live in, in um, synergy with those bacteria, all right? And it's only when someone comes in and brings something else, all right, that you have to raise your eyebrows. Or anytime you go outside of that bubble and bring something back into your home, all right? So this is a very distinct advantage, especially with the issues that we're working, at, working with right now, all right, where, where the bacteria, where the viruses are. All right. The advantages of a self-directed birth for the mother. Well, first of all, and I think this is one of the most important things to know uh, and, and to really feel, every woman has instinctual responses to her birth. Let me say it again. Every woman has instinctual responses to her birth. That doesn't mean that every woman acts on them, and it doesn't mean that every woman accesses them. All right, but every woman has them, and when you have an undisturbed birth in your own under your own level of direction, you're running on your instinctual responses. They're going to come up. You're going to know what to do. I promise you, those 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 responses are there. I've heard women say often, "I I knew what to do, but no one would listen to me." Or, I wanted to do that, but everybody said I needed to do this, and it just didn't fit. Do you see what I mean? You had those instinctual responses. Now, when you're at home, there's no interference with that. 
all right? Turn to your instinctual responses. You'll know what's going on. You'll know what to do. Why? Because your instinctual responses don't come from ordinary reality. They don't come from the thinking mind. They come from the feeling and knowing places, all right? Even more than the feeling place, it's the knowing place. Now, I'm going to say this. I think it's obvious that birth does not happen in ordinary reality. Well, well where are we? We're, we're in altered states of consciousness. And what's the value of an altered state of consciousness? <laughs> your perspective expands. You widen your gaze. You know stuff. You know things. Okay? And that's what happens, all right, to the mom in an undisturbed birth. Okay, her instinctual responses are there, all right? They're easily accessed. There's no one pushing them down. There's no self-doubt because you know, and you know what you know, all right? This is the empowerment we're talking about when we're talking about birth, okay? And empowering and transforming women. It's coming to that place of, of knowing, and then you walk into motherhood knowing. So this is a distinct advantage to a self-directed birth, all right? That you, your instinctual responses will be valued, all right? Now, what else do moms have going for them? Well, extra blood, let me explain. You were never designed to carry and nurture an eight, nine, whatever pound baby. Uh, without help, without help in your, phys without physiologic help. So there's a hormone that women produce, tons of it in pregnancy, progesterone for gestation. What does progesterone do? It relaxes smooth muscle tissue. Well, good. The uterus will be relaxed now so that implantation can take place. But Right there at the very beginning of your pregnancy, progesterone relaxes your entire vascular system, that smooth muscle tissue. Why? Because in the course of the first 28 to 30 weeks of your pregnancy, a normal healthy woman will build 50% more blood. She will have 50% more blood in her body. And that's for the baby. That's how a woman has a successful pregnancy without any detriment to herself. She has all of this extra blood carrying the oxygen and glucose for this baby. And it starts immediately. It's, it starts at conception. All right? So a woman who has five liters of blood, normally speaking, will build 50% more so that by term, she will have seven and a half liters of blood. She has more blood, all right? So this not only is important in, in uh, nurturing a baby, all right? But this is also important as a hedge against hemorrhage as a hedge against losing too much blood. Why? Because she has 50% more blood. Knowing that should help you relax, okay, about the specter of a hemorrhage. I haven't seen, I haven't seen them. One, okay? And I know that mothers are going to normalize their blood volume after the birth, so of course there's going to be uh, letting go of a certain amount of blood, all right? You have two and a half liters, yes? That, that, that don't need to be in your bloodstream anymore. So women bleed, uh, okay? And if you don't bleed, how do you normalize your blood volume? You sweat and you pee after the birth for a day, a couple of days. You see what I'm saying? So you have some extra blood to lose, all right? And when we say, oh, well, there was a hemorrhage, um, she, she was losing blood, she was getting shocky, that, that happens, okay? But, but the reason is not because she's losing so much blood, it's because she's losing it fast. 
pregnancy, that blood will, that birthing blood will come out slowly, all right, so as not to put the system in shock. So uh, I, I feel like your body has created a, a very um, successful mechanism for you not to have a hemorrhage, not to have a blood loss that compromises you, all right? And thirdly, your body has something called uterine pacemakers. And these are little nodes of electromagnetic tissue, sort of like your sinoatrial node that is your, that, uh, by your pacemaker there, or for your heart. The uterus has two pacemakers, and they're right under the insertion of the tubes, okay? And if you are having a problem, if you are having bleeding, and you feel like it's too much, whether the placenta is in or out, and we'll discuss this in a, later, uh, all, all, what, what, the first line of defense is more contractions. The answer to bleeding is contractions. All right, placenta in, placenta out, right away, two days later, the answer is contractions. All right, and what, what, what a woman can do, now watch this. When a woman is pregnant, okay, and then after the pregnancy, her uterus goes down with the baby, all right, and you'll notice that, that she doesn't birth a baby from a large uterus and then all of a sudden it collapses. No, no, no. She births a baby. As, as the baby's coming down, the uterus tight around the baby comes down smaller and smaller and smaller. This is another protective feature, all right, and then um, if, if, if you wanted to find the uterine pacemakers, well, they're right here under the, under the opening of the tubes. So all a mother has to do to, to get contractions, she doesn't have to rub them up, she, she just strokes the pacemakers like this. All right, so simple, right there within reach. All right, this is much more successful when a mom strokes the pacemakers rather than someone else comes and tries to do that or handles the uterus or anything like that, okay? Mom has her own uterine pacemakers and they will oftentimes, bring, they're for bringing on those contractions and keeping them coming. So, these are the advantages of a self-directed birth to a mom in the sense that her instinctual responses will be respected because there may not be anybody there to override her. She knows she has extra blood, so she's not going to worry about a hemorrhage. And she's got those uterine pacemakers, and she can use them to keep labor going. If labor is long and, and something's not happening, she can stroke the pacemakers. How many... I have seen women uh, laboring and just doing this, okay, without any knowledge that they're actually stroking their pacemakers, keeping the contractions coming, all right, and, and keeping, the, uh, keeping things in a straightforward manner, all right? Okay, let's look at the father or the partner. Well, the advantage of a self-directed <laughs> birth to a partner is his investment is strong, Okay, he, he is not going to be usurped by any other person. His investment is there, and it's acknowledged, okay, in the sense that th this is two people who are invested in each other, all right? Now, because of that, uh, we also know that the father has instinctual responses, Does it, doesn't, doesn't they, don't they? Of course, all right? Fathers, who knows, who knows you better? In many ways, it, it's the father, your partner, who knows you better than anyone else on the planet. They know your instinctual reactions, and they have theirs. As you them, you know theirs, and, and you have your own, okay? So, what can happen in a situation like this is that the, 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 the partner can, can have input in the birth. All right? Uh, partners who step up and, and allow their instinctual reactions to also come out. And I don't mean freaking out. You know what I'm saying. I, I mean partners and you and your partner who, who have become the ultimate intimate advocates for each other in this birth. Okay? 
this is this is what a self-directed birth can bring to the family. All right, intimate advocacy, and dads, partners, fathers. I mean, yeah, I know it. it, it there's a responsibility involved in having a self-directed birth. It's always the responsibility of the parents to make the right decisions. Okay, for your, for for what unfolds in your birth, and. And for dads, it, it's not like you have to have a sheet of things to do or read three books or, or, or take a course even. Just, just have your instinctual responses and, and follow your partners, all right? And, and be her perfect intimate advocate in this experience. You'll see how amazing this is, all right, when two people... I, and let me tell you a quick story. Once I, I missed a birth, and um, I, w I was working with a couple who lived about an hour and a half away from me, and they were an older couple, and they had two children who were in their tw early 20s, and then all of a sudden they're having another baby, okay? And they're pretty excited about it, you know? I mean, they're happy about it. They really are. And um, so... At the time, I, uh, I was working with them. One day she called me. She says, it's been years, okay, but I might be in labor. I don't want to call you too soon and so on and so forth. And this was kind of like the days before cell phones, if you can imagine. So I went to her house, and she was like, oh, you know, she said, I, I called you back. Your, your husband said you had left. Uh... You know, after I talked to you, everything stopped. And I haven't had another contraction since I got off the phone with you. And I said, well, okay, that, that's part of being a midwife, you know, you know. And so I hung around a while and nothing, nothing was happening at all, all right? So we, we agreed that I should go back home. And I did. And when I got home, um, my husband was like, you, you need to call Teresa really fast here. I think something's going on. I called her and she said, you know, we had our baby. <laughs> okay. She said, as soon when you, after you left, you were gone about 10 minutes and I started having contractions again. And uh, she said, so the baby's here and it was good. It was great. You know, it was wonderful. And and uh, she said we had the placenta too, by the way. It, you know, it's, it's, it's we're complete. And um, I said, okay. Uh, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm sorry I missed it. And, and she, you know what she said to me? She said, I, I don't want you to be sorry. And I don't want you to say that anymore. She said, something happened between Buddy and I. Like we, we worked seamlessly together. I, I mean, he knew what I needed. I, I knew where he was at. We, we were just perfect together. She said, something happened to us. We up-leveled our entire relationship, our marriage, our ability to raise this child, you know, at this point in our lives. We are so excited. We are so in love again and in love with this whole experience of being parents again. And if you... She said, nothing personal, we love you, but if you had been at the birth, it would have been different. But he wouldn't have stepped up. He would have defaulted to you because you're the person in the room with the most knowledge about birth. And she said, I'm glad you weren't there, so don't be sorry. This is what I'm talking about, the perfect, intimate advocate. All right? And this is the dad, the father the partner. And another thing that happens when another uh, advantage, all right, of, of being a self in a self-directed milieu is that as a partner, you can be yourself. You, you can be yourself. No one has any role to give you. Uh, you're not wallpaper. You're not extraneous in the, in the experience, all right? You can be who you are. And with your partner in that way, all right? And then you've got to know this. If you are a dad, all right, you hold the charge for this birth. 
You do. You hold the charge. Why? Because culturally, socially, <laughs> familially, legally, and lawfully, you are the person who takes this baby home. You are the person who takes these two people home, this mother and this child. You are the person that steps up and provides for them. So in our culture, you hold the charge. I'm not saying you're in charge of the birth and you, you know, you get to make all these decisions. I'm saying, I think you know what I mean, the, as the advocate, you hold the charge for what's happening. Here's a woman giving birth, all right? She may not be in ordinary reality for very long in this experience, and that's okay. She's going into a deeper, more richer state of consciousness. You're going with her, all right? You're going with her. You can be yourselves together. The transformation that can happen in a self-directed experience is incredible. All right? Okay, now let's look at the fetus. All right, what are some things that the fetus have that make it um, advantageous to have a self-directed birth? Well, the, I'm starting with the, the amniotic fluid. All right, generally speaking, in a self-directed birth, no one is going to rupture your membranes, all right? Meaning that um, the, the fluid stays intact. And while there's fluid, the cord floats. The cord is made to float up and not be down by the uh, cervix, all right? And therefore, it stays up and there's a lessening of any kind of a cord prolapse as long when, when the waters are intact. Also... Amniotic fluid is bacteriostatic, all right? Now, it's not a bactericide. It doesn't kill bacteria. It's bacteriostatic in the sense that it prevents the growth of bacteria. So, of course, the baby is in this bacteriostatic fluid. And then, when generally waters will, will the membranes will rupture when the baby is coming down and pushing on the bag and stretching it and the baby's coming and getting ready to be born, that fluid is released, okay, and it coats the whole vaginal area with a, a layer of bacteriostatic fluid. And the baby comes down through that, meaning that the baby is protected from a lot of uh, of, of whatever is in the, the vagina. Have people been putting their hands in there? Uh, do, do you see what I'm saying? This is a survival mechanism for babies. The cord floats, all right? The fluid is bacteriostatic, preventing the growth of bacteria. And the baby comes through that milieu. Yes, all right? Okay. Um, a baby has a blueprint for birth. They know. They know how to be born. That's why a lot of times when we have a posterior baby, all right, the, the baby's uh, back is in the back there, all right, that baby will go all the way around and make a long arc rotation to come out in the way of the blueprint. See? Uh, babies know how they want to come out. And just relax. Mom, Dad, just relax. I mean, the labor is not just all about the mother. The labor is this dance. This birth is a dance between a mother and a baby, all right? The baby is doing a lot of stuff during this. So kind of just relax and follow the labor. Follow the baby. Follow what the mother is instinctually wanting to do because she is in tandem with her baby's instinctual response. Do babies have instinctual responses? Well, maybe that's all they really have, okay? And, and can they be communicated? Well, of course, all right? So the less we do, the more we'll learn, honestly, about what is authentic and organic in the birthing realm. Okay, so the baby has the blueprint. Okay, here's something else. You got to know this. There is such a thing as fetal hemoglobin. All right, we have adult hemoglobin, but the fetus has a very different type of hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin being the oxygen carrying, uh, you know, capacity of your blood. Hemoglobin attracts oxygen. 
uh, all right, on the red blood cell. So, and each red blood cell carries a, a billion molecules of oxygen. Now, in the fetus, that those molecules of oxygen, that hemoglobin that carries the oxygen and then releases it, does it in a very different way than for adults. It's time release. It lasts longer. It lasts longer. Now, there is um, a wonderful doctor. He, actually, he's passed away. He was in a, a, he was Australian, Dr. John Stevens, and and he he uh, taught me about fetal hemoglobin. And, and how his he believed as uh, that that because of fetal hemoglobin, a fetus could go without oxygen for up to an hour. All right, without oxygen, if like a cord got pinched or 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 something like that. Uh, all right, because he fetal hemoglobin is time release. So relax. All right, this baby is built for survival with the amniotic fluid and the bacteriostatic nature of it, with um, knowing the blueprint, with fetal home, uh, hemoglobin, all right? And last but not least, there is a placenta. The fetus has an advocate, an organ that was created just for this baby. It's like a twin, okay? And that placenta, is not going to come off under normal circumstances, is not coming off that uterine wall until a birthed baby is breathing comfortably. All right? And here's another thing. If that baby, when that baby comes out and breathes, okay, and then the placenta no longer takes back uh, uh, blood to oxygenate it, when that placenta downloads blood, this baby gets one third more blood than they had in their body, okay? Because one third of their blood is in the placenta and, and the cord being circulated and oxygenated. So, so what else could you do for a baby in, except give them a download of highly oxygenated, glucose-rich blood, okay? After the birth. So babies are well protected in the sense of being able to take a moment to initiate respirations and breathing, okay? And, um, and because the placenta is doing double duty as um, the baby's still nurturing the baby and still oxygenating the baby until the baby is breathing comfortably. Then it will consider separating. And all this is done through pressure changes that happen when the baby takes their first breath and opens those alveoli in the lungs, all right, and starts to breathe really fast. Why? Because they're blowing off carbon dioxide and opening more and more alveoli and, and removing, pushing the remaining fluid in the lungs into the interstitial fluid between the cells, okay? This is all happening after the birth. And did you know that babies are also in that first five minutes after birth? They're also, they're taking their first breath, okay? And they're also changing over from fetal to neonatal circulation. I mean, that's a whole other amazing lesson that we could have. But um, so, so those babies, they're going to come out, all right? They may look a little, oh, you know, travel weary, okay? Then they'll, they'll pink up. If your baby is um, dark skinned, you'll see the pink coming on the mucous membranes. All right. And they'll get their tone back and they will be alert. Well, your baby's fine. Okay. Your baby is fine. Uh, I, in all my years, I've only seen one baby that wasn't fine. Okay. Uh, I've only seen one baby that needed to be res resuscitated, and we resuscitated that baby, and that baby is fine today. Okay, so I, I feel like I feel like babies are built to survive. I really do, and I want to leave you with that particular uh, that particular knowing or and, and understanding. So if if you know what what 
if you know your physiology and how the physiology favors actually not being disturbed or managed in a birth, okay, you would be able to relax and see the advantages, all right, of a self-directed birth at home. Okay, so we've talked about having faith, well, well, let's talk about having faith and trust in yourself. All right, you can because you know that your your physiology undergirds that, and that is that is so real and, and so organic. Okay, talking about your physiology should give you uh, an innate sense of faith and trust in the process of birth, in uh, in your body, uh, for dads in the in the unfolding of a birth in a straightforward way, knowing that your your partner has extra blood, your baby has fetal hemoglobin, uh, we're good to go. But I do know that on people's minds is also, well, what, what if something went wrong? What could happen? All right, we're, we're told that hospitals are the safest place to be, all right, in case something like that happens. Um, I think if you are a high risk, having a high risk pregnancy, all right, that maybe a, a, a self-directed birth is not the right thing for you. Maybe the hospital is a good place to be. I can't make that decision, but you can certainly make that, and I certainly uphold that. All right. Most of the women, I guess all the women that I have worked with over the years, I thought were normal, healthy women. So what I'm really saying uh, and targeting is women who are I don't know, normal and healthy. What does that even mean? I mean, normal and healthy. We get sick and then we get well. We get a cold, we get over it. Okay? We get the blues and then we get depressed and then we're back. Okay? We, we have the mechanism inside of us to find our way back through the cycles, okay, of ebb and flow, of being on top and then having a crash and coming back up again. Uh, all right? To me, that's normal and healthy. And those are the women that were um, under my care for the most part. And normal and healthy women, I found, do not have a lot of complications. They, uh, I, I can't really speak to all of the um, major complications I've seen because I haven't. All right, so I want to tell you this. I, I feel the women that I worked with were nurtured. Nurture each other, all right? Dads and partners, nurture mom. Mom, nurture your baby. You can't really teach nurturing, but you can certainly demonstrate it, and it goes a long way. Okay? It really does. All right? Along with trust and nurturing, be prepared to go to some of these deeper places where, where the information that you're looking for is there. Oftentimes, the information that you're looking for is not in your head. And thinking about it and thinking about it just muddles it, really, and just makes you anxious. Just let it go, all right? Just let it go. Follow your labor. Go into those deeper, deeper places. You don't have to have any particular practice or, or anything to do that. Just just follow. Just follow yourself where you want to go. Follow your baby. All right? Our babies are not living in ordinary reality. They're living in that brainwave state of deep delta where your brainwaves slow way down. All right? Uh, okay? And in those slowing brainwaves, we have the opportunity to extract the meaning and the content of our lives, not just the experiences, not just the external experiences that we have in ordinary reality. It's, it's where we process and extract the, 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 the meaning, all right, and the profundity of life. Now, you, women go to those places in pregnancy. You recognize them, all right? You recognize those places. You're, look at your dream life in pregnancy, right? And, and where are you when you're dreaming? You're not in ordinary reality. You're not dead. You're in an altered state. So welcome those altered states. See what they have for you. Remember, your baby is in a constant altered state with very slow brain waves. And when we say connect to your baby, what are we saying? Go down into the altered state of consciousness where you and your baby can communicate. 
all right? And this, this is going to take you through labor. This is going to make your labor straightforward. And, and this is going to show you that you don't really... You don't really need complications. Complications happen up in ordinary reality, up in the thinking mind, up in the anxious mind. I, I feel like when I'm going back to undisturbed birth, when women are not disturbed, they go into these deeper states. And they know, they know what to do if something comes up. They know what to do if the labor is going on and on, okay? And they, they know that that's not okay. Let, let me, just give me a moment, all right? Give me a moment. Sometimes what a woman needs is to be, is just to have her space, to, to kind of, you know, let it settle. And then she knows what to do, all right? Sometimes it's the dad who knows what to do or the partner who knows what to do. It's like, you know, I, I, I've seen you do this. Why don't you try that? Ah, oh, yes. It's amazing, all right, what can happen, the transformation that can happen through this undisturbed birth. Go for that. Complication, that way, if, if, if something comes up, you'll be in a much better place, a much sounder place, a knowing place to deal with it. All right? So what comes up? Prolonged labor, uh, the baby breathing, the mom bleeding. All right? And I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Have faith and trust. Okay? Have faith and trust because if something is wrong, you will know. On some level, you'll know. And you will seek help. All right? But if you're fear-based, if you're really worried, and I know that, you know, it's not like you can just turn off a switch, okay, and say, oh, I'm not afraid anymore, or I don't have to. I, I understand that. Um, but oftentimes, you're not sure then whether you're making decisions instinctively or just out of fear, okay? So, think about that. Feel that. Feel into that. What am I making my decision out of? Fear? Or is this a, a, seer, a true knowing that I have about something? All right? And um, let me just say this thing to you. I mean, we're here on this planet, all of us, and we, we learn things. You know, and, and we have a, 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 a good description of, of learning our lessons. We need to learn our lessons, okay? And I knew that if I were going to do this work as a midwife, I needed to be very clear how I learn my lessons. So I made a decision and a contract, if you will, that I will learn my lessons, bring them, you know, but I will not learn my lessons through tragedy. I do not need to learn my lessons over the body of a pregnant woman. I do not need that. I will learn my lessons through wisdom, not through wounds. And I feel that that guided me in my practice, and I feel that that's why I saw very few complications, because I, neither the mom or I needed to learn our lessons through any kind of a tragedy like that. But you know what? It really is a punctuation mark on our culture in the sense that in our culture, we talk a lot about learning our, when a tragedy occurs, we talk a lot about learning our lessons. And I feel like we almost prefer to learn our lessons through tragedy or wounding rather than through wisdom. All right? So let's not do that anymore. We don't need to do that. We don't need to have complications to learn our lessons. Unless we do. What do I know? All right? But let me leave you with that. There's no need for you to have a complication, is there? No. So be it. I wish you all the best, all right, and um, thank you for listening.